So uh, our first session today is on superficial venous disease. I'm going to be the moderator of this session. I'm also going to start off uh, with the first uh, discussion, which, which is it's all about ambulatory venous hypertension. So uh, in order to understand ambulatory venous hypertension, we have to kind of um, understand the terms a little bit. So uh, in humans, hydrostatic pressure is the pressure blood exerts on the wall of the blood vessel, and oncotic pressure is the force that's opposite that in the interstitium. So uh, we, uh, the term P equals PGH plus atmosphere, where P is the density, G is the gravity, and H is the height, and the uh, height is important here in this discussion. So if you look at this diagram here, uh, this is essentially uh, using those formulas of what the pressure is in the venous system depending upon height. So you have your hydrostatic pressure, and then you have your dynamic pressure or your water pressure. So if you, your hydrostatic pressure, if you think of it as a column of blood, so if you take a typical, you know, you know, five foot nine or six foot person, the, the pressure at the lowest port of that would be the weight of the, of the water above it. So it's the same thing for those of you who are scuba divers. It's the same thing as atmospheric pressure. The lower you go in the dive, the more weight of the water that's on you, and that's basically hydrostatic pressure. But in humans, we have a dynamic pressure. So normally, the formula would say that the pressure at your ankle should be 94, but typically it's between the range of four and 10 millimeters because of dynamic pressure. And this is also why we have passive um, uh, movement of blood in the venous system from the arterial side because arterial pressure is hard, higher. So if you think about this column of blood here and you break it up into these different cylinders, that's exactly how your valves work. It takes that column of blood in the venous system, breaks it up into different small columns, which breaks up the, the pressures that distributes it along the venous system. When the valves are dysfunctional, you essentially have a continuous column of blood. And instead of having dynamic pressure, now what you have is hydrostatic pressure, which leads to venous hypertension. In addition, being in the supine position is very important, and this is one of the reasons why we tell our patients that there's no need to wear your compression stockings at night, because when you're laying flat, the pressure in your lower extremity should be the same as the pressure in your heart. There should be no need to have additional compression uh, to kind of force the blood towards your heart. So supine position uh, is, is why the pressure is lower, and therefore most people say, you know, when I lie down at night, my, they, my swelling goes away, and then when I stand up during the day, it starts to come back. The calf muscle pump is the most important feature here in, in terms of dynamic pressure. And what I tell patients when I'm explaining this to them is that your calf muscle pump is like a peripheral heart. Every time your calf muscle pump squeezes, it ejects blood out of your leg and, it, and into your heart. And when we have people who have calf muscle pump dysfunction, specifically in our elderly patients or our patients who have arthritis, who have poor ankle range of motion, the calf muscle pump is dysfunctional. And so you can get a functional venous hypertension in patients who may have a normal duplex scan. And typically we see this in our morbidly obese patients. So, and th this is just an APG diagram indicating how the calf muscle pumps work. Every time your calf muscle pump squeezes, you see that you get a decrease in the, in the pressure. And then when the calf muscle pump relaxes, it goes back up to your venous pressure. So this is what a normal venous volume would look like. And when someone who's got calf muscle pump dysfunction, it, you don't get that decrease that you see when you get that initial squeeze. So uh, just a little bit on anatomy. So in the superficial system, we all know that we have the great and the um, small saphenous systems. And then this is just what the venographic findings look like here. And then in your deep system, you've got your common femoral. Uh, in the, the second panel over here, let's see, do I, I don't have a pointer. That's, uh, is this it? So right here, this configuration here is the most typical configuration you see in the deep system where the popliteal vein bifurcates into your femoral vein and then into your deep femoral vein. There's actually four configurations that are most commonly seen, but this is the most common configuration. Here, what you see is the duplicated popliteal system. So in the femoral veins and the popliteal veins are duplicated 30% of the time in the normal population. So this is not an uncommon finding. And then here you have the paired tibial veins as well as the perforator veins. So uh, some of the um, signs that you need to know to understand uh, venous hypertension a little bit is you'll, get, you'll see some uh, duplex scan findings which tell you that there may be something else going on. And typically one of the most common things you'll see is a pulsatile waveform. Your techs will come to you and they say that when they're scanning the deep system or the saphenofemoral junction, they'll see pulsatile waveform 
oftentimes this can be the first sign that there may be some right heart failure in these patients. And typically when you send these patients to our cardiology colleagues, they're gonna do an echocardiogram. Now one of the things that we can do is if you have an abdominal probe in your lab is that you can look at the inferior vena cava behind the liver. And what you'll see is that this is what the normal looks like, but then if there's right heart failure, you're gonna see a doubling of the size of the inferior vena cava, which is a very sensitive sign that there's some right ventricular heart failure here in these patients. This is also the echocardiogram that they'll do. These are some of the measurements that they'll make. So they'll look at the right ventricle, they'll look at diameter measurements. The right ventricle is the smaller ventricle of the two. Uh, and then uh, when they have various signs that they look at. And this one is the one more sensitive sign. So this is actually the left ventricle. This is called the D sign, which is also very sensitive for right ventricular heart failure. So in this patient, this is a typical class 4A patient, skin damage, leg swelling. The lower reflex exam is negative. Right, so what that should do is that should prompt you to say, this is a person who's got typical chronic venous insufficiency findings, lower extremity duplex is normal, there's gotta be some source of venous hypertension someplace else, so what you should do is you should look higher, and Kathy alluded to that in her, in her talk this morning about looking about pelvic sources of reflux, right? Here's another patient. There is a suprapubic varicosity right here, and no vulvar varices and no medial thigh varices, and when we do the duplex scan, you'll see here there's a loss of phasicity here. So typically what that means is there's a proximal obstruction. And in this particular patient, her common femoral was patent, but she had an external iliac vein occlusion, and she compensated it by developing a large cross pelvic collateral. So whenever you see these suprapubic varicosities, you should, you should think proximal, and that there's usually an obstructive process someplace. So again, this was her um, venogram when we took her to, to, to fix this. And what you see here, here's the common femoral artery. And right here, there's a, there's a uh, segmental external iliac vein occlusion. This is the large collateral that she developed. It was right here, and it goes across to her pelvis. And this is also some, uh, some super, I'm sorry, intrapelvic collaterals, cross pelvic collaterals uh, over the uh, uterus. And then this is uh, reconstituted itself in the common femoral vein. So again, on physical exam, you can identify a lot of these patients who have higher disease if you just take a look at it. This is another typical finding. This is a caput medusa, where you see all of these veins that are going through the abdominal wall. Usually after birth, you don't see these because the umbilical vein shuts down. But in people who have, uh, for whatever reasons, an inferior vena cava occlusion, these, these veins reopen again. So when you see a caput medusa like this, this is an IVC occlusion until proven otherwise. Again, so I mentioned to you also about uh, ankle range of motion. There's people who have the functional um, uh, calf muscle pump dysfunction. So this is a patient of mine who could barely move his ankle at all. He had these typical uh, signs and symptoms here. He also had some superficial disease. But after we took care of his superficial disease, we got him into a physical therapy program and to increase his calf muscle pump function. And then finally, this is uh, another finding. This is a patient who had a motorcycle accident in his 20s has had problems with venous ulcers all his life. Uh, I got it down to this little, little bit here, but I couldn't get it closed. And then what we did is a duplex of the perivenous surrounding areas here. And you can see it's just surrounded by these, ch these channels here. Also a good place for varathena, right? So if you get close those channels, this thing closed within two weeks after we injected it. So identifying the sources of the venous hypertension is very important. You have to be diligent. You have to know what the clinical signs and symptoms are. And if you do that, we can correct these things and get these patients healed. And then finally, uh, this is something that Mark Meiser talks a lot about, and I, I absolutely believe he's correct. We have patients who are just morbidly obese, and you can do all the scans, you can do the APGs, you'll find nothing on them. And the fact is they just have intra-abdominal pressure. And I think that these patients have a functional compartment syndrome, which leads to swelling and lipedema and all these other causes. These people, what they need is a weight reduction program, and they don't need, they don't need us. So in conclusion, you know, systemic and local issues can impede venous return and cause venous hypertension. You need to assess your patients and know the clinical signs and symptoms that have a high index of suspicion. History and physical clearly is important. Knowing the different waveforms and the duplex scans which give you the tip-offs are also clearly important. And the reflux and obstruction are common causes that impede venous return.